Okay, without further ado, I introduce you to Dr. Robin Nagel, our anthropologist. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Commissioner Terso. Uh, I want to start by congratulating you on having a job in the most important uniformed force on the streets of New York City. And I say that meaning no disrespect for our cousins in police and fire. But if we're not out there first, there's no city for them to protect. There's no city for them to go and keep safe from crime and fire and mischief. We are primary. We're the first ones out the door and we're the last ones on the scene when there's any kind of a um, it's a mega scale disaster like the September 11th attacks or Hurricane Sandy, and I'll show you some images from there. Those of you in the back during this talk, if you can't hear me, just uh, raise your hand, give a holler. Um, uh, as Commissioner Tristan mentioned, I was on the job. I'm very proud that I was on the job. Those of you who only got your driver's license about a week before you got your CDL permit and then that, the driving thing, you'll get used to it. Remember that nobody wants to play chicken with you, because not because you're the biggest thing on the road, but you might be the one thing they just don't want to be too close to. And that's a good thing when you're driving that truck. Um, today I'm going to show you the history. I'm going to try and make clear why we are the most important force on the streets and what New York was like before we were doing our jobs well. Um, some of your family members or, or neighbors might not understand the absolute rock bottom essential nature of this job and they, you can tell some stories from this talk that I think will help make that clearer. Um, I will also make clear to you how it is far more dangerous than being a cop or a firefighter. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you are three times, you are three times more likely to be injured or killed in the line of duty as a sanitation worker, okay? No one really knows that. Um, the statistics are out there, but it doesn't get a lot of attention. It's one of my missions to make that fact known so that you all stay safer and the public might give you a little more leeway because it's usually members of the public in altercations with us, uh, usually with motor vehicles that cause the harm. But all right, without any further ado, now I'll do the lights. So New York City is built on trash. This is Lower Manhattan, the landmass when Henry Hudson arrived in 1609, and that grid on top is the contemporary street grid. The pin is where we were allowed to throw our trash in 1657. You notice that it's on the edge of the water. That's mostly along what is today Pearl Street. And uh, the, all of the land that's underneath there now, that pin, so these two pins, they're in the exact same location. That All that land is built of fill and much of it is household trash. Anybody who does construction down there has to have an archaeologist go in first to dig up what are today considered treasures, but 400 years ago were considered waste. That's a little bit more just to show you the, how much we filled in Lower Manhattan. So if you jump a couple of hundred years up to the 19th century, the 1800s, we were famous by then throughout the world for being absolutely filthy, even though other grand cities had figured out how to clean the streets. We dumped a lot of waste into the harbors to the point where we actually clogged our own shipping channels eight different times one year, which meant it would be like clogging up all the highways coming in and out of the city. Uh, commerce couldn't the ships couldn't come in or go out because we were throwing so much trash into the harbor. This is a political cartoon suggesting that we use garbage to make heat and light for the poor, but of course we do that now with waste to energy facilities. So this is kind of a, a political cartoon that actually predicted the future. The reason we were so dirty was because the corruption of the city was so complete. People were hired as street cleaners, but part of your salary back in the day would go into the pockets of the politician who helped you get the job, and then with those, that money would go into the hands of politicians further up the chain. So they got fat and rich while the people living in the most crowded, most desperate corners of New York, which was the rest of us, were being killed by diseases that even then we knew how to predict. It became a tourist attraction for people from the upper classes to come and look at how the poorer quarters lived. Um, it was a desperate, dirty place. This is a photograph from 1893. This is what it looked like. This is simply the streets of New York every day as long as anybody could ever remember. Nobody had ever seen a clean street in generations because this is just the conditions. People would come and sweep 
And then quite a while later, maybe an hour, maybe a day, maybe a week later, the carters would come to take away the sweepings. As you can imagine, that's not a very successful way of doing the job. In 1895, there was a reform mayor elected who appointed this guy commissioner of street cleaning. First he offered the job to Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt said, what are you, nuts? That's, it's impossible. You can't clean the streets of New York. So this guy took it on. He was a Civil War veteran. He was a um, colonel, and he was a self-styled sanitary engineer. He was very good at what today we would call PR. He took a workforce that looked kind of like this, and you, you can't really read the caption here, but the, the middle guy is a new sanitation worker, essentially, and the, the guys are on either side of him are saying, what are you doing sweeping today? What, you could wait to sweep tomorrow, right? <laughs> that, was, that was the attitude. So he turned it into a workforce that looked like this. Your uniforms now are green and this kind of very bright yellow green so that you're more visible in traffic. Imagine if you were wearing white. There are a few reasons that you wear white, that he put his guys in white. It already was affiliated with ideas of public health and public hygiene and medical authority. If you're wearing white, part of your job is about keeping the city healthy. And he gave them the same helmets of the cops of the day, again to underscore their authority. And he put them in white also because it's a whole lot harder to sneak off to the pub for a pint when you're dressed like that. So there was a worker surveillance element of the uniform as well. Uh, if you were a carter, not a sweeper, you wore the same uniform but in brown. He made sure that the engines of the department, that would be the horses, were the right breed and strength and got the right care so that they could help us do the job of, this is roll call. You hitch your wagon to your horse and you get your orders and you go out on the street. Have you guys been through uh, OJT yet? No. Okay, when you go out there, it won't look quite like this. <laughs> but same idea. You hitch yourself to your truck, and you get your orders, and you go out into the world. Um, and you fill your, fill your cart, in this case, your truck. The, he also instituted the first curbside recycling program in New York, which meant that people who had earned their living as gleaners and scavengers were out of a job, and that really affected women and children. So he made sure women got this job. If you look at this image in the far right, there's a woman on the line. So he made sure that he wasn't displacing people who depended on scavenging from the streets to make a living. He uh, was, some of you are going to, all of you actually are going to be broom trained. The broom is a kick. I was broom qualified. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Looking for the ideal mechanical broom is still kind of a holy grail. This is a patent application from 1896. Waring had a lot of detractors. His enemy said, look, he's spending a lot more money. And he said, yeah, I'm spending about a fifth more money than had been spent before. But look at the results. So these are the pictures from 1893, the exact same location two years later. So he had only been in office by this point for five or six months. And he absolutely transformed this city. No one thought it could be done. Um, uh, but he did it. And he gave us a level of quality and cleanliness and an expectation of street, basic street decency, what a street is supposed to look like and how we're supposed to expect to be able to walk around on it without becoming sick by our own city, by his work with us. In other words, with the workers of what was then the Department of Street Cleaning. So how do you celebrate that accomplishment? You throw yourself a parade. He had a parade of street sweepers from, uh, it went from 60th Street and 5th Avenue down to 23rd where it turned. It uh, was in front of the uh, reviewing stand at 42nd and 5th, which is now the New York Public Library, but back then was a reservoir. If you were in the district that had the best marching formation and the tightest, sort of the best groomed horses, you'd win a prize. And the competition for this was very stiff for many years. As the uniform changed, it stayed white. This was in the teens and 20s. Um, notice the book that the foreman is holding here. That's the probably the time book. We still use that, actually. We have the computer counterpart, but until we're uh, absolutely certain that the computer version is flawless. We're going to use that big book. The white uniform became a pop culture kind of symbol. Charlie Chaplin in City Lights is here as a white wing. He, uh, this is a film from the, a year later called Three on a Match. The white wing, the DSC, we were known nationwide. There was a Broadway play. There were poems. There were novels. We were not just heroes here in New York. We were heroes across the country. 
Um, the work, as you see, this is a three-team cart. You belong to International Brotherhood of Teamsters, Local 831. Teamsters comes from being able to master horses. It was a very, um, it was a skill that took time. And it was, uh, some people thought it was an unskilled job, just as some people think your job is not particularly a skilled labor. It is deeply skilled, and it'll take you a while to master it. Um, you won't have loads quite like this, and you will not be tipping them with your muscle, you'll have the hydraulics, directly into a barge below. Uh, but you will dump in some districts, dump your load and go out for more. This is where it was tipped into barges like this, or maybe the, the like this, where they didn't actually sail. Um, but when they were being filled, they were also being picked over by um, scow trimmers. A trimmer makes sure a scow is balanced so that the load will sail true, but they also are pulling things. You can't quite see it, but there are people on the load, right? And they're pulling things off to then use to sell or to, or to survive. And under the docks were their families. People, entire communities lived under the docks, um, making, uh, surviving based on the, the, the waste of the rest of the city. I am not sure, oh yeah, we can do this, good. Maybe. Is that gonna roll? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So if you were on the job back in the day, and you're tipping your cart, you would not be on the barge because the barge was private. That's like pri the difference between private and municipal today. But these guys, there's no worker safety. They're not wearing hazmat or respirators. There's no OSHA protecting them. And meanwhile, their wives and children and brothers and cousins are right underneath the dock waiting for them to toss what might be saleable or edible. I'm just going to let this roll for a minute. It's. Uh, by Thomas Edison, 1903. Oh, thank you. Um, Laser, right there. Good. Oh, yeah, there's your foot. Uh, Thomas Edison did a series of these uh, lovely videos, very short little clips of mundane, everyday New York City life in 1903. If you uh, do a YouTube search for it, you can see um, some lovely little uh, images of what we were 100 some odd years ago. Keep in mind, most of, much of what came out of these carts was ash. So, you know, if there's any kind of wind, that ash is uh, definitely not going to stay in one place. Quite a job, huh? There were city council hearings about the health effects of this work for the people who were in the scows. It was understood that if you were Italian and you had this work, you were inherently suited to it. And that you were, this was, you were genetically, they didn't say genetically, but you were um, born to be on the scows, trimming, trimming the scows this way. The, they were then pulled out to sea where they were dumped. You see them offloading with its rakes and shovels and whatnot, and it looks kind of precarious, like um, maybe th these guys are going to fall in. They did. And often, that was it. They were not able to be rescued. So you have a wage earner for a very humble living who may be the only source of income for a family who's lost at sea. There's no obituary in any fancy paper. Uh, but these are the jobs that kept New York alive. And, and it, it, just, it breaks my heart how the sacrifices that people made and the anonymity of that. OK. You've been told, I'm uh, assuming by Supervisor Tramposh, that when it snows, the city owns you. Now, today, when it snows this winter, the city owns you. You have no idea what that means. Come winter, you will understand what that means. Here's a little bit of the history of what that takes. When it snows, we're the ones who are out there. These guys are tandem plowing. This is where one plow, have you done tandem plowing yet? Have you done snow train? Okay, so you know. Even back when it was horses and carts, we did tandem plowing. This, I love that this is a very fancy contraption with no windshield. You will make piles. When there's lots and lots of snow, you will make piles and then go after them later. These are piles in Times Square in 1917. We do not anymore dump into the rivers. We dump into snow melters, and then that goes into the sewage treatment system. This is a snow melter in action. It's positioned over a sewer cap that's open so that no untreated snow water goes into the Hudson. That's a V-plow. Obviously, they're very excited about this V-plow, all of those people standing around. That's a V-plow today. Snow's a little deeper now. Uh, plow's a little bigger. That's a powerful thing to be playing with. Cleaning and collection, that's most of your jobs are going to be focused on that. The truck over time got very tall. 
and uh, it looked like you could kind of have some fun loading out that truck. Really tall, the, and most of those bags are full of ashes. So when you're toting a 60-gallon overfull plastic tub in Staten Island somewhere, be grateful you don't have to throw it up the equivalent of a story or a story and a half of height. They got lower then in the 30s and 40s. This, I think, would make a fantastic postcard. I especially like this. We work quietly while you sleep. <laughs> the Garwood became Heil. The former commissioner of sanitation who started on the trucks in 1960, he remembers working this um, escalator truck. We used to be able to put all kinds of things in the trash, tires and paint and leftover toys and whatnot. As you know, we segregate a lot of that now into separate categories. Once it gets picked up, it has to be put down somewhere. Fresh Kills Landfill was our last active landfill. The garbage barges, still back then by barge up until 2001, actually, uh, was taken to the city's landfills and offloaded into these three-sided wagons called Athe wagons. They were pulled by tractor up to the active face and then tipped. Uh, if you have come from a job where you hated your office or you are ever in a job within sanitation where you don't like your office mate or you just you're, you have no windows or for whatever reason you don't like the conditions, remember this picture? That's his office. That's the bank foreman's office. He's supervising the sanitation workers who are building the landfill. They've restored one of those out at Fresh Kills. It's, it's, uh, it's still there. The barges uh, sailed to Fresh Kills uh, until the landfill closed in March of 2001. This is a map that was made in 1995 when Fresh Kills was in full swing. And here's what it's called. Fresh Kills Park, undeveloped. One of the things you'll learn with a career dealing with solid waste is how people don't like to talk about it. They don't like to say what it is, which is very curious to me. It's garbage. We make a lot of it. We need to get rid of it. And our job in the department is to make sure that getting rid of happens efficiently and, and well. So why can't we just call it what it is? Why was this map, why did it not say landfill? This is just to give you a little bit of sense of the geography of that, of where Fresh Kills was. This is the, these, these barges are going back empty and then these are going to be unloaded. It was a six and seven day a week operation, 24 hour. The cable cranes were replaced by hydraulic cranes, but it was the same idea. Those are empty barges going back. This is, a, this is an FEL, and that's a pay hauler. There's the cab of the pay hauler, just to give you a sense of scale. And this, this particular contraption, piece of equipment, um, the, the wheels are taller than the tallest man in this room. The wheels are as tall as the ceiling of this room. The, uh, this gives you a little bit of a sense. That's a, we were, this was a class I took out there in 95, and we're standing in front of that, that pay hauler. That's a class I took out last year. Uh, Fresh Kills is a transformed place. The last barge, as I said, went left in March of 2001, and this is pretty much what it looked like um, uh, in the months after that. But you see what's on the horizon, of course. So when those towers were attacked, the people who worked at the landfill knew before the city made the official uh, decision, the only place the material could come to be sorted and searched. The only place feasible was Fresh Kills. So our re emergency response went into full gear when those towers came down. We were on the scene from within the first hours. We were, the first loads came to Fresh Kills, which because it had been closed for several months, none of the Fresh Kills, none of the Trade Center material was ever mingled with fresh garbage. There's a lot of very heated emotion around that fact that, it, that the material went to Fresh Kills. Um, thinking that it was mingled with garbage. It was not. It never was. The garbage is many, many feet below the surface. But so we were there from the first day, and the very first loads came out to the Staten Island landfill uh, that night, September 12th. We reactivated the barge system, and we made very clear to the city, we were expert on moving very large quantities of material very efficiently, and in ways that you could track every ton. There was no chance of it being um, siphoned off by people who were trying to maybe make a quick buck out of that tragedy. About three weeks in, this is how the, uh, it was called then section one and nine began to take shape. The nickname for it became the city on the hill. Um, Fresh Kills now is becoming a first class park. This is, w this is uh, going to be a memorial for the September 11th material. And in fact, these structures will point directly at 
where the Trade Tower stood in Lower Manhattan. And this is pretty much what it looks like today. It's uh, absolutely beautiful. If you have a chance to take a tour, um, jump on it, because you will be dazzled and amazed, especially how many of you live in Staten Island? So you're, you may be used to the idea of this space as the dump. It is no more the dump. It is going to be one of the most remarkable parks, not just in the system of New York, but in, in the Northeast. That's a red-winged blackbird sitting there on top of a, a methane pipe. Hurricane Sandy struck, and again, we were, one of the, we were the very first uh, government agency responding in many neighborhoods, and we were the last on the scene, even though many people's own homes were destroyed. There was one chief whose home was turned into nothing but a pile of kindling who slept at the garage for, um, I forget how many weeks, seven days, he was doing seven day weeks and 14 hour days to help the city recover. Um, we were there from the beginning. This, uh, Chris Paduanu, who has been an instructor out here, he did this illustration. One of the many things I really love about this picture, that's not a young Sandman. Some of us who are not so young very much appreciate that he gives that Sandman some, some depth of time. The very first St. Patrick, Patrick's Day parade after the hurricane, these kinds of signs were all along the route. You will learn, you don't get this kind of thanks very often. There were people marching that parade, whom I have known for many years, who are tough men and tough women. There were tears in their eyes from the outpouring of gratitude from the Rockaways to us because we were there all throughout. FEMA closed because of bad weather during the hurricane recovery. We were there all, 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 the whole time, the whole time. So we have we had a marching band that played for presidents and kings. We this was the band coming out of the Yankee Stadium when there was a three-game series between sanitation and police. Oh, didn't we just win? We just won the softball tournament against who? Fire or police? I forget if it was fire. We won. We won. It, all right, it was just softball, but we won. Okay. We also have a football team. Keep keep this in mind. If you play for the football team, if you get injured playing football, you get injured. It's not a lodi. If you play for fire or police football and you get injured, it is a Lodi. Take that to Harry and get him to do something about it. <laughs> we have a pipe and drum band now. The brass band has, is history, but the pipe and drum band still does us proud at lots of different ceremonial occasions. This is a garage in Brooklyn. I, roll call is not going to look quite this tight, except if there's a photographer around, and then you'll you know, stand up a little straighter. We had many incinerators all through the city, and one of the jobs of sanitation back then was to run them. This guy's wearing wooden soles on his feet, and the respirator it got so hot, it melted the soles of regular shoes. So you had to have these wooden clog things on your feet to keep yourself safe. These are just some pictures of the equipment as they evolved over time. This would have been in uh, a parade. We're still, still, from before George Waring's time up to today, trying to get the public to not fucking litter, excuse my French, but you will, you will encounter this and it will blow your mind that you're out there sweeping or cleaning and some moron is dropping the litter not 10 feet from the basket. It was ever thus. Don't yell at them because you'll lose that battle. Um, we had a quarterly magazine for about 15 years called Sweep, which was all about the doings of the department. Um, they had these little sort of games like, can you tell which father and son go together, and, and little ways on keeping sharp on the job. Um, this is a ticker tape cleanup from the 80s. This is Times Square cleanup from this past year. If you can get that gig, man, you got the best seat in the house. So uh, <laughs> you also get some good OT on that. Uh, this is another ticker tape cleanup. We just had a ticker tape on the, on the 10th, I think, of July. As you know, not all sanitation workers are men. Many of us are girls. It is a legacy job. These guys look related, right? It, is a, it goes from father to son. It now also goes from father to daughter and mother to daughter. I mentioned that the job is dangerous. These were two separate accidents. They were not involved in, they didn't hit, it, hit each other. But both sanitation workers in both of these trucks were killed. Both of them left families, small children. When you're out there, one of them died at night doing a run to the dump in New Jersey. Um, please, 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 please be extra awake and aware that you are at, in harm's way all the time on this job, okay? I do not want to come to anybody's funeral 
I don't mean to be somber here, but this is just a fact. You're in harm's way all the time. So stay awake. If you need to, well, never mind getting into how you stay awake. Just stay awake. <laughs> Funerals. We have an artist in residence. We have had an artist in residence for nearly 40 years. This is one of her artworks. The idea of the mirror on the truck is that the public sees themselves reflected here, and perhaps will remember that what's in that truck, they created. You serve the city to help us New Yorkers stay safe from ourselves, right? So that was part of Merrill's mission. Her very first work with the department was to shake hands with every single sanitation worker in the entire system and say to every single one, thank you for keeping New York City alive. Not just clean, alive. And that's the bottom truth of this job. That's why it's the most important uniform force out there, because we keep the city alive. That's, an, uh, that's Merrill today. Um, this is the, uh, uh, the strike of 1968, famous, famous event that inspired the workers in Memphis to then strike, which took Martin Luther King Jr. to Memphis in April of that year. Um, I don't want to say that our strike had anything to do with his assassination, but the movement of getting respect and basic decency behind the jobs that we do came at a, at a steep price. This is this class from last year. These guys, I hate to tell you, they all got you beat, and they will not let you forget that when you go out into the field. This is CRS. Some of you, uh, have, has any part of this training been out at CRS, the Central Repair Shop in Queens? That's where these classes used to be. So this is, you will, at, at some point in your career, there are some Queens garages adjacent to this. That's one of our core facilities. This is uh, um, an MTS, Marine Transfer Station, and an incinerator on West 12th Street in the West Village. This is what it looks like today. They took down the smokestacks in the 80s when that was decommissioned. Uh, the, uh, we didn't call it an incinerator. We called it the destructor plant. Um, I, I think that this would be an ideal location for a sanitation museum. The, uh, this is at 215th Street in Inwood. This is, uh, it was built in 1936, I believe. There's a grace to our architecture that uh, because of what it's about, the public tends to discount. But in fact, it, it has an elegance to it. This is the new combined garage at Spring Street and the West Side Highway. Some of you will end up working there. It's the first sanitation garage in the city that's built to lead standards. In other words, there are all kinds of environmental and sustainable measures built into the structure of this building that will, uh, I'm sure, help it be an award-winning place. It also has a green roof. They don't trust that you're going to go up there and not try to hide. So show them that you're going to do the right thing, and the green roof will probably be a really excellent place to hang out for lunch or breaks or what have you. This is the Staten Island Transfer Station. Some of you will end up working there. 125 Ward Street, which is the headquarters for the Department of Sanitation, the building was built in the 30s. And you see that we are part, were then part of the Departments of Health and Hospitals. Again, underscoring our primary role in protecting the public health of New York City. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning how much of Lower Manhattan is built on fill. All of the, all of the shaded areas here are built on fill. Fully 20% of the larger metropolitan region is essentially built on garbage. So not only do we keep the city safe from itself every day by keeping it clean and therefore alive, we built New York. We walk on New York's history every day because of the garbage that is now called archaeological artifact that is underneath our feet. This, this, I was cursing out the people who litter, right? This encapsulates, this is a good summary of the whole problem. So the drunk guy just had his beer, it's empty, he doesn't need the can anymore, he drops the can, and the cop's saying, is this yours? Of course not, it's empty. I'm gonna borrow this as a prop. So this plastic water bottle, when I'm done with it, I'm not gonna save it and pass it down to my son who will pass it to his, this is not my family legacy heritage water bottle. When it's empty, it's empty, and I don't need it and I don't want it. So I'm gonna let go of it. Hopefully I'll put it in a recycling fit. Uh, bin. But a whole lot of people are just going to let go of it, and that's where we come in. We, it's almost like tending to children, right? I hate to say this, but the public is often like children. And this guy's attitude, perfect. It's not mine anymore. It's empty. I don't, I don't care about it. This is from the 1964 issue of National Geographic that talked about the World's Fair. 
Um, this is at Times Square when it's already becoming kind of a red light district. I looked it up. Not Tonight Henry is this weird soft porn film. I don't recommend that you watch it, but that's where he was. Um, this is just a picture of a truck in Manhattan 3, which is my neighborhood right now. This is a shameless plug for my book, which is all about us. What is it to be a sanitation worker, and why should anybody care to know that? That's the book. And in fact, I worked with this guy. His name is Joey Damiano. He's out of Manhattan 7. And this is that parade of the White Wings. Um, let me see if we can make that roll. There we go. And that's the end of my talk. I'm happy to take questions from you guys. We're going to let this roll a little bit because it's a lovely, it just shows what, the jo what it looked like on the job back in 1903. You won't, you won't do this? Although, Vito, maybe we should make Maybe we, will. Maybe we will revive this, and we can be in parades. You guys are going to get class A's. You're going to get class A's, which is you're not going to be mandated to, to buy them. But if you want them, and you want to look really sharp, you can. I highly recommend it. I've also suggested to the commissioner, just as when you're hired into the police and fire departments, you get a proper picture with the flags on either side, and then your mom gets to put it on the piano, right? <laughs> I call it the piano picture. We don't have that. We should have that. I suggested that to the commissioner last week. She loves that idea. So there may be an opportunity for the piano picture, which I think we deserve nothing less. <laughs> anyway, thank you for letting me talk to you. <laughs> Do you have any questions or comments? Yes, sir. <laughs> the salary back then, I believe it was about $750 a year, and that was for, that was in the 1890s, um, and they pushed to get it raised, and of course the, there was some back and forth about should it be raised and could it be raised, and that was also for a six-day, 12-hour work week that then I think they got that pulled back to 10 hours, and it wasn't until decades later that they got it pulled back to a five-day work week. It was until, I believe, the 1940s. It was a six-day, 10-hour work week. It took, a close, it took close to a strike to getting the sanitation worker work week down to a 40-hour work week. I, the, answering that question, I should have a better sense of like what did it what did it cost to live in that era? Like seven hundred fifty, but what does that mean? I that's a nice question, and I'll do a little homework on that. So ask me again when I see you next time. Like yes, sir. <laughs> not not really. Can you speak up? So in the case of a disaster, sanitation is the first one on the scene. In the case of nine eleven, the air quality was really bad for a long time. What steps did the department take to protect workers? Sanitation, like many other city agencies, required um, various respirators that got more and more serious as the work progressed. Enforcement of that was difficult at ground zero. Anyone who worked at the landfill, you were not allowed to actually go up to the, the what became called the city on the hill if you were not fit test for a respirator and then used not just the respirator but a full hazmat suit every time you went up and then did decon when you came down. Anyone who broke that protocol lost the privilege of working at the landfill, which is where more, more of us worked than were downtown. One of the struggles now all these years later is to get some of the medical facilities who are doing long-term care for people who worked in the recovery and response to September 11th to include sanitation. You will often see many agencies listed, even some that you wouldn't imagine why they'd be listed, and we're not on that list. We, you ha we have to write ourselves in under other. So one of the things that the department has pushed for is to make sure that we are acknowledged as ground zero workers, just like the more obvious departments. Um, there is an emergency plan in place to protect those from disasters like that. There, there, actually, I don't, I don't know if there is a plan because, for instance, the response to Sandy was a very different project than the response to September 11th. So I, I don't know that there's a plan in place. Um, but there are certainly protocols in place for workers to be protected when they are asked to step forward like that. Did you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, actually, I, I project pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we were out there during Sandy, and um, 
We were asked by actually your union president, Harry Nespoli, to do air and noise monitoring. I'm, uh, as chief of safety and training, I'm involved in uh, a, a program that involves all city agencies called Citywide Health and Safety Program, or CHASP. And basically, it involves every agency in the city when there's any disaster, man-made or natural, it was formed out of 9-11 to protect all city workers. And with that arrangement between the agencies, and it was chairman by the Department of Health, we had conversations maybe every other day during Sandy about what each agency is doing uh, to protect their workers, the kind of hazards that each agency faced in Sandy. And uh, what came out of it was that the Department of Health had set up air and noise monitoring in Staten Island and also in Far Rockaway for a number of days. Uh, they call it uh, quantitative because they actually put devices on sanitation workers, noise devices, as well as air devices. And basically, the readings came back that we were fine, okay, as far as that's concerned. Uh, so again, with that arrangement uh, being formed, it's to protect you all. And uh, out of 9-11, again, it was formulated and it really aided the department as well as all other city workers in protecting them during Sandy. And uh, that's what came out of that. So uh, back to Robin. Thank you, Chief. Yes, sir. Oh, do you miss being on the field? I miss it so much. I miss it so much. I'll tell you why. There's some, all right. Some of you will work with assholes. <laughs> but for the most part, your coworkers will be some of the solidest, decentest people you will ever, ever work with. Most decent. The bestest and the wonderfulest. <laughs> You, as I say, there'll be some jerks. Don't pay them any mind. And I'm sure you've been warned about the locker room lawyers, right? Don't pay them any mind either. The people are going to try to steer you wrong. Stick with me, kid. I'll make sure that you don't get caught breaking the rules. Ha! They have seniority. Nothing will happen to them. You're on probation. You'll go down. It almost, almost happened to me. Almost happened to me. It's a chapter in the book called Lost in the Bronx. Anyway, when, when I was on the job, not only was I working with some of the best people I'd ever met, some of the smartest. I teach at a university, right? That doesn't mean anything in terms of smarts. Smarts is everywhere. But I also had the satisfaction of going down a street, and at the end of the block, I could turn around and that street was a whole lot better because I had been there. My work mattered. My work had an immediate consequence. And if I did it badly, that had an immediate consequence as well. It, was, it just wasn't as sharp as it could have been. I miss it a lot. I miss it a lot. There's also a way in which friendships form on the job that are not like university life. Um, in fact, I was going to talk to Commissioner Terso about I haven't been in the field in a while, in fact, in too long. I can't come back on the job because I just missed the last test. I mean, imagine if I came on. Anyway, I, I'm going to be back in the field soon, I hope. No, I see. And um, I will probably run into some of you. So then you can tell me what you actually think of this talk and how I could make it better. But I miss it a lot. I miss it a lot. There was a hand here. Yes, sir. Has anybody um, perished from um from the, the effects of 9-11? Has anyone perished from the effects of 9-11? Uh, yes. Yes, they have. Um, whether or not full legal and medical authentic authentication of that is 100% behind those deaths, but there's strong evidence in at least some cases um, that, yeah, they were direct, it was a direct cause. Because of what they, what they yeah, respiratory, uh, yeah, being exposed to some pretty serious respiratory um, assaults. One more question. I don't want to end on a, on a somber note. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, I noticed the equipment they used to use in the early 1900s, or early, that uh, modern or anything, but the city still looked a lot cleaner back then. <laughs> the city looked cleaner back then than it does now. I mean, you got the pictures of the before and after. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the before and after. Yeah, we did that with horses and carts. That's true. Part of the problem that we have now with plastics, 
and with, with litter and, and disposable products being so much more ubiquitous and so much easier to like get caught by the wind. And the, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a, we don't have buckets full of ashes, barrels full of ashes. We don't have wood like we had then. We don't have even that much glass anymore. Um, garbage is going through a process that is called light weighting. You won't believe that when you're doing yard waste that's like, you know, that 100 gallon. There'll be plenty, of, you'll be hauling plenty of weight. But it's a very different, like if you, when you do an inventory of waste from 120 years ago versus an inventory of waste now, it's an entirely different collection of stuff. Um, and we now have 8.5 million people to clean up after. Whereas when, where, especially when Waring was commissioner, New York City was only Manhattan and part of the Bronx. It was not yet the five boroughs. That didn't happen until 1898. So yeah, it's a different, it's both a very different project today and also it's just the same. Instead of a horse and a cart, you have a truck. But it's still the same, pro, the same challenge. It's on your bodies. You are going to be picking up New York. That's your job. When did we start wearing green? When did we start wearing green? The third, the, the, we were in white through the early 30s, like mid 30s. And then we went to a combination of green and white. Yep. And then for a while, we were green and orange. Mm -hmm. And then we went all green, but the trucks were white. The trucks didn't used to be white. Yeah, there's a whole, yes, yes. You got a lot of questions, yes. They're working on a calendar. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Dr. Mayer.